So in um, 2006, my worst nightmare as a mother and a wife came true for me. Um, I was 29 years old and my husband had a car accident that claimed his life and our six-year-old son Adam's life and left our 19-month-old Connor with a spinal cord injury, high level, leaving him a quadriplegic and on a ventilator. And, you know, I wasn't giving much hope for Connor's life. Um, I was pushed pretty hard actually to let him go, but I just believed, you know, that that wasn't a survivable wreck. And it's kind of the, how I got the name of my book, Unsurvivable, um, because everything we've been through has been unsurvivable, but we have survived it by the grace of God. And so that's kind of, kind of how my story came about, of course, with the, the book. So of course there's so, so much to our story along the way as well, but that's kind of the start of it. Yeah, which is a pretty, you know, I say catastrophic, catastrophic, but also hope filled, you know, start. I was even chatting with someone earlier and they were talking about the fact that they were at a memorial service for a life that had been lost and um, how the that life they were able to rejoice. And now I know that there is so much heartache when we lose someone, especially abruptly like that, and then struggling through saving the life of, of a child that's still left over with you there in that spiritual realm. I mean, um, what was going on with you physically for you to even be able to mentally process what was happening? You know, it was really tough because, you know, trying to grieve my husband, my other son and fighting to keep Connor alive. There was a lot going on kind of at that moment. And um, we were in the hospital for three and a half months before we actually got to come home. And we were at a children's hospital in Dallas, Texas, which is two hours from where we live. Um, but I do think that that probably was a good thing because I think that if I was close to home and I was having to come home to my memories immediately, I think it just would have been too much to bear. I can literally see the hand of God in the steps of everything through all this. But, um, you know, I couldn't I had to grieve in spurts. Of course, I couldn't bear grieving Chris and Adam at the same time. Um, and then I had to also focus on being a mom and, you know, doing everything I could to keep Connor alive because it really was fighting for his life because the doctors just didn't agree with my decision to move forward with his life because they didn't think he would have any kind of quality of life being a quadriplegic and on a ventilator. And, you know, part of my story, which my book cover has a rainbow on it, but I'll never forget having our family meeting with the doctors when they sat down to tell me the worst case scenario, which totally understand they've got to give all that to you. Um, and then whenever they told me, you know, that they thought I needed to let him go and they'd put him in my arms and just basically let me rock him to his death. I was like, oh my gosh, there's no way. And I'll never forget walking out of that room and just tell my parents I needed a minute. And I walked out into the ICU waiting room and one of my friends was in the waiting room with me. And then I called another friend on the phone just to tell him what, what they said. And I was just you know, crying my heart out to him to say, I just wish God would give me a sign that I'm making the right choice and I'm not being selfish because that's what I was told that I was being selfish to go on with this life. Mm. And I'll never forget the most beautiful rainbow at that very moment appeared over downtown Dallas. And I remember looking at my friend with me going, is this real? Am I dreaming this? And he was like, no, I think that's your sign that you're doing wow. the right thing. And so from that moment forward, I knew I didn't know how we were going to manage this new normal life we had, but I knew that God had a plan and I just had to keep trusting him. And it's, you know, oh, oh, like the, it just gives me chills, especially the part of you saying like, imagine holding your child to death, right? We rock our babies to life every day. And yes. so one that like just visual is, is, is trim, trembling, but simultaneous to that, having anyone tell a mom that she's being selfish yeah. in that scenario like that has me questioning so many things about humanity right like i feel like a lot of people try to help a scenario go one direction not with ill will and i'm sure their intention wasn't ill will even towards right. you it was out of protection or or out of their own limiting belief of God's possibilities ultimately is what it really comes down to. Um, but it's it's wild that even in the midst that there was friends there, you know, it wasn't even necessarily your parents, um, yeah. but that God's God's grace was right fully present in front of you. Yes. I it's 
we have so many amazing stories along the way. And like I said, a lot of heartache. I'm not discrediting any oh, of that. Oh, gosh, I can't imagine. But, you know, I just, just, you know, I tell people all the time, it's real funny. So we, we raised the boys up going to church, you know, before the accident happened. And, you know, we prayed with them at night when we tucked them into bed, you know, we did all those things. But I almost now looking back, it was almost like going through the motions where, and it's hard to explain that to somebody until they go through a tragedy like I walked through. And then my relationship with God is just totally different now. It's more of like literally that that daughter father relationship that I thought I had before, but I truly didn't because in all honesty, he's all I had. I mean, he, that was the only hope I had to be able to survive what I was going through. And, you know, it's, I'm so thankful that I was brought up in a Christian family and that I had the support of my parents. I mean, you know, I can truly look back over all the years and literally see how God lined everything up perfect for this storm that was about to happen. It's just, it's truly amazing when you look back at that. And at the moment in the midst of that, I did not see that. I tell people that all the time. It was, you know, a year or two down the road that I'm like, wow, you know, this is. Yeah. I mean, I could only imagine that three months you're released and yes, there was favor in being able to grieve in that space away from home, but you eventually did have to go home. Yes. You eventually did have to walk through the, the heartache and heartbreak of clearing rooms and, you know, doing things that you would never imagine having to do one as a mother, but also as a wife. And so fast forward us through like the rehabilitation of where Connor is now and, and how life then trans, you know, transformed in its new version. Yes. So, you know, of course, when I left also, we have, and, and don't get me wrong, they, the doctors were amazing there. They kept Connor alive, even though um, actually the one in particular was not a Christian. We actually asked him if he believed in God and he told us no. But, you know, so they gave me no hope. In fact, they're like, you're just going to take him home, keep him, you know, in a dark room, don't stimulate him too much. Just, you know, you just can't do much. There's no hope for this. And I'm like, I just don't believe that. You know, I was the little girl that sat at the table and was determined not to eat my food and, you know, was strong willed. And my mom, I'm like, my mom used to get so frustrated with me. I'm like, look, that strong will paid off though down the road. <laughs> yes, it did for a whole new life. <laughs> yes. But um, so my sister actually had started doing research because I'm like, I just don't believe that this is like the end. There's nothing you can do for spinal cord injuries. And so I was too busy, you know, trying to have this new normal life. So she actually started doing research and she had found a place in Baltimore, Maryland called Kennedy Krieger Institute, and they're a part of Johns Hopkins. And so a year after the accident happened, we got him down there for a consult. And um, it was unbelievable. I mean, they didn't, they don't give you false hope. I'm very careful to tell people that it's not like they were like, Oh, you're gonna come here and he's gonna walk away a walking miracle. But um, we now go um, twice a year, every six months for a two week outpatient stay, and they just do intensive rehabilitation with him, doing physical and occupational therapy, but then they also train us what to do because clearly if you're just going to go twice a year, it's not going to help him much. And so he has regained movement. Um, we do know he has all full sensation throughout his body now. He's not a, it wasn't severed. Um, he can actually like move his arms, help him to roll over. He can actually be off the vent for a few hours a day. Um, he's just truly a miracle. I mean, clearly I would love for him to be up walking by any means, but you know, I was only given a year tops is what they told me he would survive, that he would have chronic pneumonia that would claim his life. And, you know, it's been 16 and a half years and he's never had pneumonia and he's still here. So. Wow. Wow. I mean, and you've had eventually uh, a new man come in to support and love and, kind of fulfill a role that I'm sure was a void for him because for him, like mentally, was he able to process and grieve and go through that? Was he capable of, of having those same emotions that you did as a grieving wife and mom? Not, not really. I think cause he was so little. So he, you know, he, he knew in the beginning, he knew something was different, but now, I mean, you know, sure. Yeah, that's all he knows. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. That makes sense. But um, of course, we have pictures up all over the house of 
Chris and Adam, when we make sure he knows who they are, they'll never be forgotten. But BS, um, God brought an amazing man into my life. And it's funny because, you know, I truly thought I would never be able to move on because, you know, it wasn't like a divorce. I still was in love with Chris. And when Robin came into my life, it was it was tough, but he's such a great man that he stuck it out because, I mean, there were times where, you know, I felt like I was cheating on Chris. I mean, yeah, it was, wow. there was a lot of emotions that went through all that, but he stuck around and God had a plan. I mean, I, I'd say all the time, I think it's amazing because the second I was conceived, God knew he was going to come into my life at the right time too. And it's funny because my mom told me at the very beginning, she started praying that one day when my heart was ready, that God would send someone and I wouldn't close my heart off because she was really afraid of that. But, you know, he just, in fact, if you didn't know our story, like we, we travel a lot, we take Connor, we just go, we want him to see the world. And, you know, people who don't know our story, when we go places, they're like, oh, your little boy looks just like you. And it's funny because he kind of does. But, you know, I just, he has just stepped right in and he's got two boys of his own that are just like my own. And, you know, it's, it's a, it's an awesome blended family and you would, I mean, God is just good. I just don't even know what else to say there. And they all, I mean, Chris and Adam's a part of all of our lives, his boys, him. I mean, you know, it's just part of our life. So. Well, it's so neat to know that like the legacy of someone, you know, continues. Right. And we hear this, like, what does that look like when someone passes and yes, you infuse it into your child, but more so than just the legacy of in a human from, from father or grandfather to child, same for moms. It's like, this is a legacy that's infused into generations that are not even connected or couldn't have been connected prior to. And now God has made a way for this to say, hey, this storyline matters more than just this one person's human experience here on earth. And yeah. I think that's the power of storytelling. I mean, even thinking through the concept of I'm survivable I mean, how many of the people listening to this can raise their hand and be like, yeah, I've survived. I, I'm a survivor, right? I think of that song. I won't yes. break it out. I could, but I won't. <laughs> um, but I'm survivable. It, it has this different element because it's a consistency. I'm yeah. a survivor feels finite. It feels like uh, I, I did this thing and now I've overcome it. But survivor bull is reminds me of my um, kind of statement is always becoming that I'm not anywhere, right? Just like I've not just fully survived. Like I'm sure there's moments where even in positive triggers, things trigger you into memory and trigger you into happenstance and trigger you into grief. And so I just love that, that statement. And I think that if we could all be a little bit more survivable, what it would do for humanity and empathy, 